you pray with me? O oh Lord, open this gospel good news unlike it's ever been opened to us before. Though we think it's familiar, there is much here that still can be revealed to us. Open our minds and our hearts to search, <coughs> seek, and find your way forward as we begin this season of Lent. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So dearly beloved, welcome to the season of Lent. A season for all Christians to prepare ourselves for the passion, for the death, for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> our method of preparation has remained relatively unchanged for the past 2,000 years. It is rich with history and experience and tradition. So how do we prepare ourselves for Lent? We first of all begin with prayer. We pray for others and we pray for ourselves. We pray for the church, capital C, the church universal, and we pray for the world. We pray in silence and we pray together in unison. We pray and when we pray we are connected our soul with that of God. We pray daily and we pray without ceasing. How do we prepare ourselves during the season of Lent? We do penance, which is a fancy way to say that we confess our sins to God in prayer. We confess the sins that we are most acutely aware of, sins that we know that we have committed, and we confess to the sins that we're unaware of that we've committed, but we have no clue of what they are or what we've done, but yet we know that we've sinned anyways. We confess daily. We confess without ceasing. We prepare ourselves with repentance. We repent of our sins, which means that we stop the sinning. We stop dead in our tracks. We turn and we vow not to sin again. Every day during Lent, we repent and we work towards perfect abstinence from sin. We prepare ourselves by giving alms during Lent. Alms is an old-fashioned way of saying we engage in acts of charity. Charity it means we give. We give as an obligation to do what is right and what is just. We give enabling others to become self-reliant. We give anonymously. We give generously. And we give cheerfully. Lent calls us to engage in a habit of daily charitable giving. We deny ourselves during the season of Lent. We fast from all the food that we love. We are called to refrain from acts of pleasure that we might be freed to focus solely on the pursuit of spiritual goals. Lent is upon us. So let us prepare ourselves with prayer, confession, 
repentance, charity, fasting, and self-denial. Let us walk with Jesus to the cross in anticipation of the glory that we know is coming, the glory of an empty tomb. So this being the first Sunday of Lent, it's always a narration. A narration of the gospel account of Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. This year, uh, year C in the common lectionary, we draw the narrative from the gospel of Luke. But in other years, it comes from Matthew, and in lesser years, in Mark. In our eagerness to drink in the gospel, and no one is more eager than I am, in our eagerness to drink in the gospel, we find ways to immediately apply it to our lives. But every good preacher worth their salt today knows that we need to slow down the runaway train. We need to slow down lest our efforts lead us to misguided but well-intended misinterpretation. When you and I, when we experience this harrowing narrative of Jesus being tempted by the devil out in the wilderness, we are tempted to reduce the story. We are tempted to create a reduction for the purpose and meaning of all temptations that we see in our life. To, we reduce temptations to simple garden variety challenges of our individual faith. Don't reduce the story. Don't do it. Of course, we all face temptation to sin every day of our life. Of course, we should all resist temptation to sin just as Jesus did. However, the careful disciple of Jesus Christ, we should have our suspicions aroused. There's more here than a simple reduction to three lessons and encouragement to live righteously. The first tip-off to this fact, the temptation of Jesus Christ, takes place in an environment that is permeated by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Did you notice that in the story? The story is permeated with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, Luke begins. Wherever the Holy Spirit is present and active, Christian fellow journey people, take notice. Whenever the Spirit is present, take notice. Jesus had just returned from the Jordan River where he was reportedly baptized by John and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and lightened upon him. The same Spirit that that descended upon Jesus is the same spirit that overcame Mary in her immaculate conception. And we heard proclaimed from this pulpit a few Sundays ago, it is the same spirit that filled Jesus when he entered his hometown synagogue and unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and began to prophesy. It is the same spirit that allowed him to walk down from the mountain instead of being thrown off by a murderous crowd. In a similar way, Luke will paint a passion narrative at the opposite bookend of the gospel, at the opposite end of a spirit-filled Jesus who is locked in a mortal fight to the end against all the evil powers of this world. Whatever the temptations of Jesus means, it connects deeply with the Spirit's prior intervention in the life of Jesus Christ. Temptations are linked deeply, linked deeply in the life of Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? Luke says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness is deeply contested territory. The wilderness exists between two extremes, between Jericho and the lower Jordan River Valley to the east and the mountainous city of Jerusalem to the west. 
And I want you to think about contrast between the two. Between the two is the wilderness. Contrast is defined. Out in the east, there is water, there's life, there is a fertile valley. Compare that to the west, where there is arid, mountainous elevation. I want you to think about green vegetation versus brown. I want you to think about life versus rocks. Think about level and straight versus crooked and steep. I want you to think about warmth in the valley versus the cold, sub-freezing temperatures after the sun goes down. I want you to think about safety and security in the valley. But up on the mountain, where around every curve, there could be a robber or a bandit. In the wilderness, you see, the devil has the field advantage. Jesus is led by the Spirit right into the heart of darkness, into demonic danger, to engage in cosmic divine warfare in the devil's own backyard. And this is God's intent. It's God's purpose for his son Jesus Christ to take the fight for humanity straight to the doorsteps of hell. And Jesus would be armed with the power of the Holy Spirit to get the mission done. Now you'll notice that the language I'm using is militaristic. Because that's intentional. When it comes to God versus the devil, it's all about warfare. It's a fight and there's only one possible outcome to this fight, that the Lord is victorious. Not only is the wilderness the devil's playground, Jesus is placed at a further disadvantage. He's weakened by hunger and by thirst for 40 days. All the while, it says that he was facing repeated withering temptations before the big three that we read about today. The devil's last three temptations are described in the greatest of detail in the Gospel of Luke. The weakened Jesus is tempted with nourishment and strength, right? Here's a stone, turn it into bread. First observation I have about this is temptation is targeted upon the vulnerable. Notice that? Temptation targets those who are most vulnerable. The devil recognizes the divinity and power of a spirit-filled Jesus with a conditional phrase, if you are the Son of God. Now I'm going to slip into a moment of academic insight here, okay? If you are the Son of God. The devil says this three times, in each of these three temptations. The first and the third use the identical Greek language. The second one is different, though. If you are the Son of God, the better Greek translation for the first and third is a little different. It should read, since you are the Son of God. It's a very different meaning to it. Since you are the Son of God. The devil knows who Jesus is. Jesus knows that the devil knows who he is. And certainly we know who Jesus is, right? There's no secret here. Since you are the Son of God, is a better way to translate it, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. One does not live by bread alone, Jesus correctly quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Do you see the irony here? The irony of this, of the major temptations, is that this is a temptation of Jesus who feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, and by the way, has 12 baskets of abundance left over. Do you see the irony here? 
This is the Jesus who feeds the world with his body and his blood. Do you see the irony here? He quotes Deuteronomy and says, one lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Temptation number two. All these kingdoms, all these kingdoms the devil offers as if it's the world's for him to give away. The devil is so desirous to be worshipped, to be elevated above God, if only God would submit. But the devil's lying here. All glory and all authority has been given over to me, the devil says. It's fake news. It's not true. It is a lie. Nothing had been given to the devil. Nothing had been given to the devil's efforts or his evil or his sin. Nothing. So here's the second observation we can make on this, these temptations. One is the devil lies. And two, people who lie imitate the devil. Huh? Have you ever thought of that before? To which Jesus responds, loosely citing the Shema, the Lord is our God and the Lord alone. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. Jesus knows his scripture. Worship the Lord, only the Lord. Temptation number three. Jesus is taken by the devil up the mountain to the top of the temple, on top of the mountain in Jerusalem, to the very pinnacle. And the devil begins by quoting scripture. The devil quotes scripture for his evil intent. Yes, you heard me right. He quotes from the 91st Psalm, which by the way, we read in our call to worship this morning, the devil cites scripture. He says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91, 11 and 12. So observation number three is the devil knows scripture probably better than you do. The devil knows scripture better than I do and is willing to use it and to cite it for his advantage and for his evil benefits. Now the observant will recognize here a link, a link with the passion. When Jesus was crucified on top of Golgotha, there was a crowd there, and Luke describes the crowd of people were scoffing at Jesus. They were scoffing at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. Does that sound familiar? This is an intentional link in the Gospel of Luke. What this tells us is that God will not be provoked. God will not be managed even for the sake of his only begotten son. Jesus quickly throws cold water on this fire before it gets out of control. He raises his voice and for the third time he cites from Deuteronomy, this time from the 6th chapter, 16th verse, he says, Do not put the Lord your God to a test. Don't do it. So every test had been finished. Every temptation had been tried. Observation number four. God cedes nothing to the devil. Nothing. Ever. God does not cede a thing. 
to the devil. There's no negotiation. There's no concession. Not now. Not ever. Luke reports that the devil departed him until an opportune time. What is that opportune time? The devil departs Jesus until Jesus enters triumphantly through the gates of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And then the passion begins. The devil plays a prominent role during uh, uh, Holy Week, during the Passion. It begins with Judas Iscariot. The devil plays a prominent role in Caiaphas and in Herod and in Pontius Pilate. The devil permeates the crowd that brings Jesus to trial, that scoff at him at his crucifixion. So prepare yourselves, dearly beloved. God, God is at battle. He's at battle with the one who desires to take over our souls. And the Lord is willing to take it to the devil's own backyard. God brings in this cosmic struggle over our salvation. He brings his A game. He brings Jesus Christ, his son, who he fills with the Holy Spirit, empowers him to be victorious. So dearly beloved, draw heavily upon the word of God, for that is what brings nourishment and strength. Beware of lies and those who tell lies. Be warned, the devil cites scripture and probably knows it better than you and me. So in whom do we place our trust? We place our trust in Jesus Christ. Because there is no greater victory than the empty tomb. God wins. And that's the good news of this day.